recording. Thank you, Mark. Um, as some of you already do know this, but last uh, December, we lost one of our colleagues and uh, friends, um, the Reverend Clyde Schallenberger. He's someone who was well known during his time here at JHH, but uh, also um, after his retirement back in 1993. Uh, Clyde laid the foundation for spiritual care for both uh, the bedside presence of a chaplain and the spiritual and religious influence on different practices and policies of our hospital. A particular influence was the idea of medical ethics and the many conversations that he helped to raise and to begin to value amongst physicians and other hospital leaders. He was instrumental in helping to form what we have today in the form of ethics, a vibrant consultation service and an active and influential committee. But it was those clinical situations that caused both wonder and also often frustration that Clyde helped those around him to pause, to reflect, to ask difficult questions and to pursue the patient's perspective from multiple angles. In these situations, Clyde was a consoler, an influencer and a skilled spiritual practitioner. In all honesty, he helped Johns Hopkins reimagine the importance of faith and its impact on care and healing. And for this, we will always be truly grateful. During his 30 years of service, he was there for countless patients as a chaplain, supporting them at times of personal crisis and helping them cope with sickness, disease, and injury. He said, while my responsibilities have been many and varied, there is nothing more satisfying than the privilege of being available to people when they're in the midst of a life crisis and supporting them and journeying with them through that crisis. This is the legacy of care that we strive to continue today and the ways in which those in ministry often come back to value, to be available to those in the most difficult times. Even though he retired in 1993, Clyde continued as a member of our ethics committee, which again, he helped to establish back in 1985. And before 1985, he was active on a hospital committee that he initiated called the God Squad, helping everyone to wrestle with the end of life decisions and complicated end of life care. Again, paying particularly close attention to faith and its impact. The annual Schallenberger lecture given by a visiting ethicist and sponsored by our committee takes place every April in Clyde's name and was established back in 1994. Obviously it continues and it is what we're about to engage in today, but today is the first without its, found, its founder. The Johns Hopkins Hospital has a rich history with many leading figures in their fields. The Reverend Clyde Schallenberger was such a person, an advocate for patients and their families for difficult ethical conversations and for the development of spiritual care at the bedside, especially with patients and families in crisis. So today we have with us a few friends and family of Reverend Clyde Schallenberger, and I'd like to turn it over briefly to Nancy Schallenberger, who will share with a few words about her dad. Um, hello, thank you so much for the opportunity to briefly speak about my father, the Reverend Clyde R. Schallenberger. The writer and sage Kala Gibral wrote in his book, The Prophet, then the plowman said, speak to us of work. When you work with love, you bind yourself to yourself, to one another and to God. Work is love made visible. My father loved his job. He loved working at Johns Hopkins Hospital. And if you knew my father, you knew his work was love made visible. As a young child to help explain his job to me, he said he was the pastor to all the people in the hospital. And when we'd visit dad at work, he'd often take us to the Christus consular statue, the divine healer, and he would say, that's my boss. Although he did have the utmost respect for Dr. Nelson, Dr. Bob Heisel, Ron Peterson, and, and previous presidents that he worked, had the honor to work with. But my father was all about people. 
whether it was the patients, the families, the hospital staff, he loved working with people. He would get there at 536 in the morning so he could make sure the people that were on the on the late shift staff had someone there to be his advocate, to be his counselor. When you walk through the halls with my dad, he waved to everybody. He said hello to everybody from the housekeeper who kept the hospital clean and comfortable to the dedicated nursing staff, to the administrative assistants that kept the departments running smoothly, to the physicians and researchers he fo who focused on the human body and healing, to all those administrators whose budgets and vision guided what has become the renowned Johns Hopkins Medical Institutions. He was so proud to work at the hospital. Um, there's just too many stories to share, but one I'd like to share is if you went into his office on the lamp above his desk was this strange symbol, symbolic word. It was humphs. But what it meant was, how many patients have you seen today? He was always, always about the, seeing the patient, where they were, what they needed, how they could be healed with his help, with God's help, with the staff's help. And so, like Ty said, he had a vision. He saw the need for a place where staff could bring their ethical concerns about situations to be discussed and to be applied. A place, too, where patients and families could provide support and care. So out of this vision came the committee, and through his very important and meaningful work, you all honored him with this lectureship. Our family is beyond uh, joy to be here today. Um, his, his wife, my mom, his wife, my mom, Helen, his beloved wife of 70 years is here. My brother, Rick, my sister, Karen, and I are so grateful for the life that my father lived and the significant work at the hospital who honored him today. Thank you. And may your work always be your love made visible. Thank you so much, Nancy. And I am uh, also really grateful that you and others in your family could join us today. Uh, it means a lot to us. And uh, if you would just join me briefly in this blessing and we'll get started with our lecture. Beloved God, you are known to us in times of hardship, in times of peace, in the quiet moments of reflection and in the chaos of crisis. You are with us, God, as we grieve and as we celebrate. Your love is unmoving and enduring. And we lean on you today as we both grieve and remember our colleague. We ask you to be with us as we remember our friend, brother in ministry, and we appreciate his contribution and his legacy and that it may carry forward to those who need it most. May the light that you allow to shine through be a guide for others. Bless us, God, as we come and as we go. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Ty. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Cinda Rushton, and I am uh, really uh, honored to be part of this conversation today, um, not only in my role as co-chair of the Ethics Service, but um, in honoring Clyde and Nancy, I just want to um, just verify the, your impression of um, your father's work as love made visible, because that was absolutely true. And uh, I think that he would be uh, extremely um, engaged today if he were with us. Uh, because uh, we always found Clyde as a way to uh, bridge the sort of heart and head and to engage with our faith in whatever form that takes. So it is my uh, honor and pleasure today to introduce our 27th Schallenberger lecturer, Dr. Joanne Braxton. 
Dr. Braxton is the CEO and president of the board of the Braxton Institute for Sustainability, Resilience, and Joy. She is a senior scholar in the field of African-American literature and culture and is a prolific writer. She has written seven books uh, along with many, many other uh, forms of literary and scholarly writings. Her books include, um, and I'll just name a few, The Monuments of the Black Atlantic Slavery and Memory, Maya Angelou's I Know Why the Caged Bird Sings, a case book, a really important work on Black women writing autobiography, a tradition within a tradition, which is a fascinating um, account of um, African-American women. And one of her early works, uh, as she is also a poet, was called Sometimes I Think of Maryland. And I suspect she might tell us a little bit about that today, which is a collection of poetry. Dr. Braxton is the <clears throat> Francis and Edwin Cummings Professor, Professor of Humanities, now Emeritus at William and Mary. And she's also a community faculty at Eastern Virginia Medical School. While she was at William & Mary, she founded and directed the William & Mary Middle Passage Project and was PI for their uh, state-funded narrative medicine for excellence project. So she brings these humanities into her work in, uh, in, in medicine and in healthcare. More recently, she spent a year as the David B. Larson Fellow in Spirituality and Health at the Library of Congress in the John Kluge Center. She's been a wellness consultant at, to the National Institutes of Health, and she served as pastoral and spiritual caregiver in clinical, congregational, and movement settings. Currently, she is administering a, a new project called the Tree of Life, Black Faith Matters in a Time of Dual Pandemics. This uh, project was a uh, grant in response to the COVID-19 rapid response um, invitation to enable healthcare providers of color, racial justice activists, spiritual caregivers, and faith leaders to engage with one another to articulate some of the emergent struggles, hopes, resources and questions for black faith as a wellspring of sustainability during this tumultuous and crucial time. Tree of Life, Black Faith Matters in the Time of Dual Pandemics is an initiative of the Braxton Institute. And it's also sponsored by the Center for African American Religion, Sexual Politics and Social Justice at Columbia University. And they were privileged to be one of 16 recipients uh, from the Henry Luce Foundation. I've had the um, honor and privilege of working with Dr. Braxton over the last number of years, focusing on our shared interest in moral suffering and in particular, the ways in which moral injury shows up in our world, in our healthcare system, and how we might be able to um, respond, name, and heal from those betrayals so that we can continue to do the important work that we are all called to do. It's my honor to introduce to you now, Dr. Joanne Braxton. Thank you, Dr. Rushton. I'm deeply grateful and also very moved to be with you today. Um, I have experienced the ministry of presence uh, with Ty and his team yesterday and vicariously, Nancy, I believe I'm the beneficiary of your father's ministry of presence. It is my hope today that our conversation will be more in the nature of uh, a dialogue 
than um, a traditional lecture. And um, Suzanne, if you're able, would you please <clears throat> uh, project the first slide from the PowerPoint so that I can, we can just have that up as I uh, begin to share with you a little bit of our uh, model. And I'll speak about that in, in detail in a moment. Um, the work that Cindy and I have been doing together um, and which we began while I was still at the Library of Congress has to do with moral suffering, the way in which we suffer, the anguish we experience in response to moral adversity, harms, wrongs, failures, and unrelieved uh, moral stress. And we have looked at more, uh, moral suffering and stress in the disciplines of health humanities, psychology, and education, and raised questions about what the disciplines can teach each other about the prevention of harm and the healing of invisible wounds. We've even raised the question of whether there are occasions on which moral suffering should be borne and not alleviated. So we are attentive to moral suffering and the ways it can also be a useful tool for self-stewardship. And we believe that the implications of our work extend not only to healthcare, but also to education, law enforcement, and other domains of public service, including ministry and the military. So um, this also relates to the ongoing tree of life work. We have put up three um, online seminars, which um, clinicians, change makers, and others have participated. And um, we're scheduled per the terms of the grant to begin circles of care next week. But I have chosen to pause the circles of care so that we can be attentive to the wounds of the team because there is no member of my team who is untouched by, the, by some personal tragedy uh, related to COVID. And so I thank you all for being here today. And in a way, we are ministering to each other. As we meet in this most unusual juncture in American life, at the intersection of the dual pandemics of COVID-19 and American racism. Emblematic of long-term systematic inequalities throughout the healthcare system and pervasive racial discrimination in the society at large. And so one of the questions that I have is whether it is possible to reform healthcare without addressing the pervasive racial discrimination in the society at large. And I think you know where my thinking is tending on that. Yesterday, as I was reminded in the meeting with our chaplains, your wonderful chaplaincy team, yesterday was the sixth anniversary of the death of Freddie Carlos Gray Jr. 25 year old black man at the hands 
of police in the city of Baltimore, which is also a city that I love. Officer Caesar R. Goodson was convicted of second degree murder, sometimes called depraved heart murder because it is murder caused by depraved indifference. That's a legal term, a death that could have been avoided. Although other officers were charged, only he was convicted. The city erupted, but Dr. Carla Hayden, ever a beacon of light, kept Enoch Pratt Library open, a beacon of light and hope. And so that's what was happening in your fair city six years ago. As today, we await a verdict in the state of Minnesota versus Derek Chauvin in the murder of George Floyd. Floyd. The depravity of Chauvin's heart evident in his face as he not only knelt on George Floyd's neck, but taunted onlookers who begged him to spare Floyd's life. And even as that trial began, Dante Wright was killed by another officer in Brooklyn City, only 10 miles away. All of this occurs in the shadow of an unsuccessful attempted coup in our nation's capital. How did we come to this place? What can we do about it? And how can the humanities help? So here are some things I'd like to speak about today. Silence. The silence of the outraged mother, ways of seeing, ways of understanding what we see, ways of seeing newly and the role that deep listening plays in historical inquiry. The transformational power of black outrage, that is reform versus transformation. Why silencing inhibits transformation and how it works. Why safe places in professional settings are needed. Moral injury and historical trauma. Why minoritized professionals and change makers suffer elevated rates of burnout. What we can learn from the narratives of slave women again about soul murder, depraved heart murder. And if we have time, one case study from race riot to massacre, how the University of North Carolina discovered the Wilmington uh, uh, massacre of 1898 after the murder of George Floyd, Floyd and what we can learn about what is re required to recover what Toni Morrison has called discredited knowledge. That is knowledge that in her words was discredited because only black people ha have it. How the narrative gets changed and how reputations and lives are destroyed. Now we've talked about moral injury in relation to clinical settings, but I also wanna talk about the kind of moral injury that happens in the streets. People of color who happen to be in the wrong place at the wrong time are increasingly at risk and often portrayed as thugs and looters. The media often uses such terms to classify people of color protesters without an analysis of those systems that contain people in urban landscapes that may be food, news, and literacy deserts. Such terms perpetuate the disregard of marginalized populations as well as their pain and trauma. They dismiss and disregard the reasons behind the outrage, the unrest, and the civil disobedience in cities like Baltimore and Ferguson. And that's actually a quote from, from something I wrote with Michael Sainato in the Cleveland 
plane dealer a little ways back. So if you see the, um, uh, the model on the screen, what we're looking at is a process Following the work of Jack Saul, we believe that collective healing, that healing from collective trauma involves a collective process with deliberation preceding uh, healing and restoration. So part of what I'm inviting you to join us in today is a kind of narrative and aesthetic reflection uh, around moral conscience. And I want to also expose you to um, some things that you may not ordinarily be exposed to. Um, Toni Morrison, um, actually James Baldwin said, that the role of the artist is exactly the same as that of the lover. If I love you, I have to make you conscious of things you can't see. So um, I think when we consider the wounds to the uh, larger population and the way that they are experienced, we don't always um, have the tools to interpret outrage. And sometimes we turn away from outrage because it makes us uncomfortable. And this can be unfortunate because sometimes that's exactly where the knowledge is that is required for transformation. And if we have a moment toward the end I would like to play uh, one or more clips of videos from popular culture that we may be able to um, apprehend a little bit better if I'm able to share a couple of uh, restorative frameworks with you. The value of poetry in an essay for the 2020 volume, African American Poetry, 250 Years of Struggle in Song, I noted that the poet speaks with a healing song to those who experience moral wounding as a result between the gap between the promise of the American dream and the failure of much of the dominant culture to comprehend not only that Black lives matter, but that black lives, like all lives, are precious. This is important because sometimes someone will raise the question, why black lives? This is what happened at the University of North Carolina at Wilmington when the provost said, I can't have these signs up saying black lives matter. And from that statement, a discourse emerged wherein the Wilmington massacre of 1898 became visible to the university and the community and launched a transformation that included several aspects, including a new office of equity within the university so that the conversations about things that had happened in the past could continue in a sustaining way over time with curricular development and scholarship emerging as a result of the breaking of silence. But back to this question of the poet's healing song. I am a woman carrying other women in my mouth, writes Asia, Genet, Asia Monet, a Caribbean American poet of Jamaican Cuban descent from Brooklyn, New York. Her work has been called a healing balm for the soul. 
her poem, Say Her Name, is from her 2017 debut volume, My Mother Was a Freedom Fighter. According to the Center for Intersectionality and Social Policy Studies at Columbia University, the Say Her Name movement is dedicated to the Black women who have lost their lives to police violence and to their families who must go on without them. These are the women in the poet's mouth. When the poet reads her poem aloud, 21 real women who lived and walked this earth and who died too soon fly out of her mouth. They include Katherine Johnston, 92, from Atlanta, killed in her home during a drug raid on the wrong property. Eleanor Bumpers, 66, a grandmother from Bronx, New York, killed by two blasts from a 12-gauge shotgun as she was being evicted for being four months behind in her $98.65 monthly rent. Rikia Boyd, 22, shot in the back of the head as she stood in an alley with friends in Chicago. And seven-year-old Ayanna Jones, killed as she slept during a raid on her grandmother's home. Others, like 28-year-old Sandra Boyd, on her way from Chicago to Texas to take up a new job at Prairie View A&M, died after being pulled over for traffic violations. Monet's calling of these names reflects ritual, religious, and liturgical practices within communities with which this Caribbean American poet would have been familiar. And Janae, Janelle Monet, different poet, similar name, invokes the same traditions in her poem, How You Talk About. Maybe we'll just uh, take a spin with how you tom bout, if uh, you can do that now, Suzanne. Can we cue that up? It's just about two minutes. Yep, just give me one second and I'll set it up right now. This is a multi-vocal lamentation and call to action about saying names and breaking silence. Uh, to this list of names that uh, Asian Monet uh, mentioned in, um, uh, in her poem, today we might add the name of Dr. Susan Moore. And there are four Black women physicians who published an op-ed in the Washington Post about Dr. Susan Moore called Say Her Name. Dr. Moore, as you may know, uh, was a COVID uh, doc who herself succumbed to COVID, but who uh, broadcast a uh, viral video of her testimony about her experience of racism in the hospital. So we remember Dr. Susan Moore as we say her name. Now, Janelle Monet's How You Tom Bout, and I'll explain what how, how you tom bout means when we get through this two minute clip. Michael Brown, say his name, Michael Brown, say his name. 
say his name. Michael Brown, say his name. Michael Brown, won't you say his name? Say his name. 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 Won't you say his name? symbolizes that the fact that we see the bloodshed going on in this country and it won't be overlooked so we need to let the world know and you need to know that silence is the enemy and sound is the weapon thank you embodied outrage Lamentation, no lamentation, no resurrection. So here we are. By now, most of us are familiar with the last words of George Floyd, mama, 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 I need you, mama, mama. I love you, mama, I can't breathe. He had his mother's name tattooed on his torso. But who is this outraged mother? And where did she come from? And why is this man calling for his mother, even though she is deceased. To understand this phenomenon better, we need to look back into historical time to the experience of the outraged mother. I'm going to have to shorten this part of the presentation just a little bit, so I'll be editing as I go forward. I want to leave time for some interaction, but. You know, I have been a student of the autobiography of Black women. And so it was in the world of Afro-American autobiography that I first met her on the conscious plane. But then I realized I had known the outraged mother all my life with her hands on her hip and her head covered with a bandana I'm reading now from an earlier piece that I wrote. She is the sassiest woman on the face of the earth and with good reason. She is the mother of Frederick Douglass traveling 12 miles through the darkness to share a morsel of food with her mulatto son and to reassure him that he is somebody's child. She travels 12 miles back again before the dawn. 
She sacrifices and improvises for the survival of flesh and spirit. And as mother of the race, she is muse to black poets, male and female alike. She is known by many names, the most exalted being mama. Implied in all her actions and fueling her heroic ones is outrage at the abuse of her people and her person. She must be the core of our black and female experience, this American Amazon of African descent I wrote in the Massachusetts Review many years ago now. Dwelling in the moral and psychic wilderness of North America. Yet when I surveyed the literature of the critical wilderness proliferated by that moral and psychic one, I found her absent. So I realized that she had not been included in the critical literature uh, for a variety of reasons. And that the genre itself had been dominated by a kind of male bias, linear logic and either or thinking that has been somewhat uh, paralyzing. And also that academic systems did not value scholarship on black women or reward it. And that these same systems had told us that we were not first, not central, not major, not authentic. With the suggestion being that neither the lives of black women nor the study of our narratives and autobiographies was legitimate. So it seemed to me that the questions with regard to these narratives, is it first, is it major, is it central? Does it conform to established criteria? Were the wrong questions to be asking? And I began to ask the question, what would the inclusion of works by women do to change the shape of the genre? And I began to see that the kinds of questions that had been asked about the particular text, Incidents in the Life of a Slave Girl by Linda Brent, published in 1861, prohibited scholars from seeing the ways in which this text was authentic. And here is my point. If you fail to ask the right questions, you will not be able to see the evidence. And when we began to ask the questions about what would inclusion mean, we realized that the slave narrative genre actually got pushed back uh, several years into the uh, 18th century. And um, we began to see a different shape of, of the tradition. So there's a whole line of writings by Black women that attack racial oppression and sexual exploitation. And let us not forget that Black Lives Matter is a movement that was founded by black women. But here's the point. What was most important for me when I began to look closely at incidents in the life of a slave girl written under the pseudonym Linda Brent because it wasn't safe for her to write under her real name, Harriet Brent Jacobs, is that silences and gaps in the narratives of women's lives are sometimes more important than the filled spaces. Think about the number of times a colleague of color might begin to share a story or a narrative with you, and it just doesn't seem plausible. No, really? That's a silencing mechanism. But this outraged mother figure is a figure that has learned to use wit and intelligence to protect her children. That was her main goal. And this figure of George 
George Floyd's mother has an archetypal precedent in the slave narrative genre and in the literature, literature of African American women. Here are some of the ways that Linda Brandt had to conceal things in her narrative. She had to conceal her quest from, for literacy and her ability to read. Why would anyone have to do that? Because when her master discovered that she could read, he began to slip her foul notes in an attempt to seduce this 15-year-old girl. Two, she had to conceal her love for a free black man she eventually sent away for his own good, as well as the identity of the white man who becomes the father of her children and who eventually betrays her. She concealed her pregnancy from everyone. And she's in uh, North Carolina. She escapes on a ship and eventually finds her way north. But she must conceal her plans to run away working hard to appear contented in the time before she actually makes her escape. When she does run away in Edenton, North Carolina, she goes disguised as a man and she's taken to the Snaky Swamp, a place that she finds more hospitable than landed culture. And after she makes her preliminary escape to the swamp, she goes back to her grandmother's house uh, and is concealed in a crawl space uh, between the ceiling and the attic for a period of seven years. During this time, she can hear the voices of her children, but they don't know she's there because it's deemed too dangerous to share this information with children. Using disguise and concealment again, she deceives her master by writing letters that a friend mails to him from New York. And when he takes off to go to New York to look for the fugitive, she watches him ride out through a little peephole in her grandmother's, uh, in this crawl space beneath her grandmother's attic. So because, you know, she's had this unconventional life, when she gets to the North, she's advised by clergy not to uh, reveal herself fully in the narrative. So she uses that pseudonym which is the very thing that makes it impossible to confirm her identity and to confirm this narrative as one that is authentic until the 1980s. What we should note today is that it is a distinctive feature of the outraged mother that she sacrifices opportunities to escape without her children. Linda Brandt doesn't go north until she knows she has a path to freedom for her children as well. Chapter titles in her book are A New Tie to Life, Another Link to Life, The Children's Soul, New Destination for the Children, and The Meeting of Mother and Daughter. So this figure resists not so much on behalf of herself as on behalf of her children. She is part of a continuum that links the dead, the living, and the unborn. George Floyd's mother is present with him. He calls on her for her intervention and for her steady help and care as he knows he is dying. So this is where we are. I can ask you 
What is the question you have not asked? What is the evidence that you have overlooked? Citing the work of doctors Joya Creer Perry, Aletha Maybank, Nia Keys, Nia Mitchell, and Don Godbolt, I would ask, what are the practical steps needed to incorporate an anti-racist lens to remedy structural racism in medicism, in medicism, excuse me, structural racism in medicine. They wrote, the recognition of racism, not race, as a root cause or driver for health inequities and the establishment of systems that collect and disaggregate health outcome data by race and ethnicity as well as how racism may be operating can be used as the basis for community engaged quality improvement in healthcare settings. So those are my questions for you. What are the questions you have not asked? What is the evidence you may have overlooked? And what are some of the practical steps that can be taken to incorporate an anti-racist lens in a sustainable way for community engaged quality improvement. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Braxton. Um, Joanne, um, powerful as always. Um, I'm sure I'm not alone in saying uh, we are all very moved by what you've shared with us today. And um, we're at a really important juncture right now of taking stock. And I think you have um, provided us with another opportunity to go beyond the surface to some deeper questions. So thank you for that. Um, we do have an opportunity for just a few questions in the few minutes that we have left. So if you have uh, a question, and I really appreciate your framing of the questions that we haven't asked, that need to be asked, and to see if we can, um, we can engage at that level. So uh, if you have a question and you'd like to uh, have uh, an opportunity for Dr. Braxton to respond, if you could put that into the Q&A, we will um, entertain those. As we're waiting uh, for a question, um, in your model, you talk about the importance of communal healing. And I wonder if you might uh, give us just a, a thumbnail of what that might look like. Uh, how might we begin that process? Well, first of all, I wanna give thanks um, and express my gratitude to two of my personal prayer warriors who are on this call. Um, Reverend Dr. Edna Canty Jenkins and Reverend Dr. Brad Braxton. Uh, Reverend Dr. Jenkins was my mother's minister and she's one of my mothers in ministry, which means we are part of a community and it's a multi-generational community. The same is true, I think, for um, my connection with um, Dr. Braxton and the, the open church. A kind of example I can give you is um, the importance of communal um, singing and uh, prayer. Uh, we sang, we prayed, and we loved one another. This is one of the things that has helped us move forward. We also shared 
are stories. The sharing of story is very important. One of the things that was lost really to a large degree after the great migration is the sitting around and sharing of family stories in communal settings. And Toni Morrison said, this is one of the things that inspired her to write novels to replace those archetypal uh, contexts in which uh, stories were shared. Another example, when I visited the open church in Baltimore and I preached for Dr. Braxton's congregation, as by the way, we are not related so far as we know, um, except through one of his congregants, a former student of mine who's a member of my board. His members laid their hands on me. The laying on of hands in that context was worth more to me than any amount of gold. It was a way of saying, I see you, I feel you, I authorize you, go forth from here in this love. And so those are some of the traditions that we have from the past. But going forward, we use techniques like prayer, ritual, meditation, and narrative medicine. Although I always say that Black folks always had narrative medicine. We just didn't have a label for it. Beautiful. Um, one of the follow-up questions from my wonderful colleague, Dr. Phyllis Sharps, who's done amazing work in our community, is uh, to understand a little bit more about those caring circles. How, how do they work? What is the design? Um, and what could you share about that? The caring circles are designed per each particular context. So um, for the um, tree of life caring circles, um, Cinda, they are in some ways similar to um, the curriculum that we offered in the CME in, um, um, in LA. Um, but we have to stretch it out because as you know, it's hard for people to um, get away for three days to immerse themselves in, in, in a work. Um, but this is a particular group, a small group, because I have invited individuals who have participated in the seminars and therefore shown their commitment and connection, and I have um, vetted them. Um, we are using an IRB uh, protocol so that we um, construct a uh, what we hope and expect to be a safe place where uh, folks who are part of those caring circles can go deeper with me and members of my team, uh, some of whom are reinventing themselves and reinventing themselves, for example, um, a pediatrician who is um, exploring becoming a, a teacher of med meditation. I can teach meditation, but there's no need to do it all. It's better to bring forth this younger person who can show that kind of leadership. As a result of this work being made visible, others are reaching out to us to develop different 
kinds of circles of care, uh, such as one that uh, we expect to be forming to help um, environmental women environmental activists who are experiencing trauma and burnout as a result of their work. I should mention also that uh, when I was um, uh, visiting a Davis professor at Ursinus College, we did an intensive for minoritized faculty members and we took that off campus. It was not visible to everyone uh, in, the, in, the, in the college community. There were aspects of my visit at Ursinus, several workshops that were visible and they, that were open, but for those who are most dearly impacted, we wanted to create a, uh, a neutral space um, that could be held, where they could be held in care. Did I answer your question? It's a very important and uh, uh, beginning of a conversation that needs to continue. I am aware of our time and I see that we have a number of questions that we haven't been able to get to today and I'm not surprised by that. But um, I do wanna be honoring of people's uh, time and uh, your generosity in sharing so much with us today. Um, I am quite sure that, that Clyde would be um, resonating with this conversation. And I am so pleased that uh, we've had the opportunity to gather today. I wanna thank you. I wanna thank um, our colleagues in the Berman Institute and the hospital. Um, Mark as my co-chair in the ethics service, but also our colleagues in the Department of um, uh, Diversity, Equity, Inclusion, Dr. Golden, and our other colleagues in the community who have um, helped us to engage many more voices in this conversation. So thank you for being with us today. And um, this is not the end of the conversation. This is just the beginning. So thank you all for being with us and Dr. Braxton for being our 27th Schallenberger Lecture. It's an experience I will treasure for the rest of my life. Thank you very much.